Hello again. Why don't we pray as we open God's word together. Lord, thank you for uh, those promises, Lord, that are true. They are yes and amen in Jesus. Um, But part of walking with you, Lord, is for us to ask the question, Lord, what does it look like to be the church uh, in our time and where you've placed us? And Lord, we are watching the news and we are watching one and a half million people um, on the run right now. And God, we're in angst and we're waking up to the fact that this isn't the first time and that there are other things happening in the world that are equally concerning, Lord, with the Uyghur people in China, what's happened in Syria, Lord, so many around the world who are in deep need of love and care and help and ultimately, Lord, your gospel. And so we just asked this morning, we want to be compassionate, Lord. We want to listen. We want to know how to be and how you would uh, want us to be used during this time. Uh, Lord, we also uh, want to respond to your spirit this morning, uh, to listen to your voice. And so would you use um, the book of Acts, Lord, and the, the story that we are studying and as we're kind of watching the church become the church, um, would you in turn, show us how to do that as well. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. If you're just joining us, we started last week in a brand new book of the Bible, not brand new as in it just was written. It's been around for a few thousand years, but new for us because we've not studied it, at least as long as I've been here, the book of Acts, um, which if you're looking in your Bible and want to know where to find that, it's Matthew, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They're the Gospels, and then Acts. And it sounds like what it is, the Acts. But I always grew up hearing the Acts of the Apostles. It probably says that in your Bible. Um, It is. But our title of our series is the Acts of the Risen Lord Jesus. We see him acting through the church. Um, But we're also asking questions like, what do we do right now with things like Ukraine? What do we do with increasing pressure to water down our faith in such a way that doesn't offend. How do we follow Jesus in 2022? What does it look like to be the church? What are the steps that we can take? And today's message is entitled Baby Steps because you're watching the very first church in this chapter do just that. There's a grass is greener thing that we do with a lot of things. We do this in life. We're like, oh, if I could just get to this, if I could just get this paid off, just get this job, just get to this, just move here, whatever. What? the grass is greener. And then we get there and it's brown. (laughs) We're like, man, Um, there's a grass is greener thing with the church too. Um, And we say things like this. If I could have been there and seen Jesus lift off from the Mount of Olives, I would be a better follower. I would be more devoted. I think actually that those people, and by the way, they're watching, Hebrews tells us that they were surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. The people that were part of the first century church are gathered around the throne. We know they're not bored. We know they're fired up. We know that they're part of praying and worshiping and they're praying for you. They're leaning over. I used to hear a phrase like this. They're leaning over the balconies of heaven, kind of watching what's going on down there in Winona. How are they doing? How are they following Jesus. And so instead of us wondering, well, if I could have just been there, do you know what I think? As I read scripture and I look at the work of God, I think they are actually in heaven looking down going, what is it like to follow Jesus in 2022? That seems awesome. And we're like, nah, (laughs) we'll switch. You know, like the grass is greener. I think they would say to us, you know, it was kind of hard. It was difficult. We didn't know what we were doing. We're figuring this whole thing out. We watched Jesus lift off from the earth and then we're all stuck there. We got to go back and we got to do this thing called be the church and oh yeah, the mission. And so we, if we read last week that Jesus said, go and wait, how far did they have to go? About half a mile. We're going to see that in the first opening verses here. They walk back to the upper room. And so I want to give you though a picture. I love to think about the in-between moments. We read the Bible sometimes. I was just talking with a friend in the lobby there, Guy Estep, and he said, it is. It's kind of like, Acts is kind of laid out like like a social media timeline. This happened. 
Now this happened. You know, so lift off, upper room, miracles, spirit fall. Like almost like we're just disjointed, like movie scenes that are cut together. You don't ever see the in-between walking. So let's imagine a couple who have been around for these 40 days. They've seen the risen Jesus. They've been fired up, but they also have kids. And so let's say Jesus just left, let's say 10 minutes ago. Angels left. They're all kind of standing around. Well, guess we should, uh, you know, upper room? I don't know. Let's, yeah, okay, okay. They start walking back. It's kind of crowd of people. There's a bunch of people. They're walking back. They're going to the upper room. Wife says to the husband, hey, she's kind of tired and he's ornery. They have littles. I'm going to take them home. I'm going to feed them. I'm going to put them to bed. Your sister said she'd watch them. I'll meet you in the upper room. We don't think like that, do we? We think, mm -hmm. All these people had no responsibilities, no jobs, nothing. They just all along for the ride and we need to strive to be as zealous. No, they were normal people. They had stuff going on. They had to answer those questions too, just like you. What do I do with the fact that, you know, my whatever forgot their lunch again, you know, and I've got to take it over there. Praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> what do I do with the in-between moments? I think... We're going to see some of that today. Small baby steps, little things. But I want you to remember these are people just like you. The story's here so that you can identify and you can say, okay, I don't feel so weird about the fact that I've got kids too, or I've got the job, or I feel bad, or I get home and I don't really want to spend time in prayer and reading my Bible. I want to watch TV. You know, whatever it is, as you read today, I want you to be encouraged and to remember that the main character in the book of Acts is Jesus. And he plays his role perfectly. Perfectly. He is going to get it done, which is what we need to hear. So let's look. Just two verses. Just get us started. Acts 1 verse 12. You're at the moment. They have just left the Mount of Olives. Fireworks and all. Now it's all died down. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet. Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. What that meant was you were only allowed to walk a certain amount of distance on the Sabbath, which scholars believe is about half a mile. Apparently that wasn't work. So half a mile you can do. You go past half a mile, boy, you're in trouble. So Sabbath day's journey, which means the house was close. Mount of Olives, they go to the house, go to the upper room. When they'd entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying now listen to the names and think about why did they put the names? Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Altheus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. To which I bet anytime this was read, he was like, no, not that Judas. I'm the other one. <laughs> Verse 14, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. If it was a tweet, hashtag praying and waiting. Woo! I think you look at this list of names and have you ever walked into church and looked across and nudged somebody and said, oh my gosh, look who it is. Can you believe they're in church? Yes. Praying and everything. Oh my goodness. I would have never guessed. We do that all the time, don't we? But it is kind of the whole deal. Like it's, we come here because we need Jesus. And so people show up that need Jesus. And maybe yesterday they were really needing Jesus and we didn't like them. And then they come to church and we're like, huh. we, hmm, okay. Well, maybe I'll be Christian to them today. I'm going to go. <laughs> right? We look at people and we are so surprised that Somebody showed up in church. I look at this list of names and that's what I think. What an extraordinary gathering of people that should not be together. They shouldn't be unified. Shouldn't be in the same room with each other. They don't like to be in the same room with each other. But Jesus, 
the main character in the book of Acts in the Bible has a way of making things like this happen. So let's just walk through the list real quick. The first four names, rough neck fishermen, guys that were used to just being out there smelling like fish, fired up when they didn't catch any, maybe a few words went flying. Those things had to be dealt with, but those are the first four people that Jesus picked to be part of his team. Roughneck fisherman, a turncoat Jew who was collecting taxes for the enemy against his own people. Matthew, by the way, a political zealot who was trained to use violence to get things done. Yeah, we hate the Romans. We're going to kill them all. Yep, he's on the team. The women are there. The women are extraordinary because not only have they been there, and when the disciples were all running, the, the women stayed. But it, you look in the gospel, you see a couple of places where it says they actually gave of their own money to support Jesus and the boys. Of their own stuff, they provided. They were tithing before it was cool. The women were doing that. And they're here, and it's unusual because men and women didn't mingle in this way. Rabbi, teacher, learning, there were no like girls and boys colleges back then. It was like men only got to do this. And while that was a bad thing, Jesus said, yeah, we're breaking that rule. He brings them in. And so the women are there. Who else is there? There's quiet ones. There are loud ones. There are very devoted religious ones. And there are others who are like, man, I don't like that. There are family members who thought he was crazy, who now believe they're there. How did they get in the same room? Don't jump on to, we're not even into what they're about to do. Just look at who's in the room. This is what Jesus does. He gets people in the room that should not be together. People from opposing sides who have been against each other, have hated each other. See, the body of Christ is supposed to be, I'm going to say supposed to be, a place of community, inclusion. Walls are broken down where you feel like you fit in. You got a place. These are my people. This is my family. I've got friendships here. There's unity. There's diversity. There's acceptance everywhere. Paul wrote about it, Galatians 3. Later, he said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. You are all one in Jesus Christ. At least that's how it's supposed to work. <clears throat> Doesn't quite work that way, does it? We all know that if you don't find it in one church, there's something wrong with that church. Go find another. And we think, yeah, finding friends at church is easy, right? Uh, it isn't. Now, let me say this. What is possible in Jesus is not always experienced or sustained. I don't use the word community here because it's kind of a sterile word. I'm really looking for community in my life. We don't say that. You know what we say, though? I really like friends. I love people that want to be around me. I love for people that want to call me to go hang out, get wings. I don't know, something. Watch the game. If I'm going to have these relationships for eternity, I'd like for them to be a little more than tolerable. I'd like to at least like some people. Wouldn't you think? <laughs> like if we're going to be with each other forever. So let's bring this to the surface. Let's pull this uh, sunken ship up from the bottom. <laughs> Church, for me, has been the place where I have found some of the most significant friendships. People that I know and believe love me truly through my good days and bad, through my ups and downs who would give anything for me or my family. I really like talking to them. I feel like I can be honest. I can share deep needs. But it is also at church that I have experienced the most hurt, been betrayed, experienced backstabbing, felt used, forgotten, and lonely. And those timelines run in the same time frame. It isn't, wow, yeah, that's what it used to. No, I found the perfect church, though, blah, blah. No, they run concurrently. Why is this the case? If you haven't been disappointed in church yet, let's make it more specific. If we haven't disappointed you yet, 
give us time. We're working on it. We will. It'll happen. There is no perfect place. Imperfect people, perfect Savior and gospel. There's a now but not yet aspect to community, to friendship in the body of Christ. Listen, it's been bought and paid for, but do we experience it all the time? No way. No way. So how they do it? Are they really doing it? What does it mean? Are we getting just a snapshot, the Twitter post that says, yeah, they were devoted all in one accord. Actually, what you're going to see in the book of Acts is the up and down nature of trying to do this. But there's a little hint, at least to put you in the right direction, something to grease the skids, maybe a little bit, get that thing moving a little bit, relationship. Look at this verse. They were together, all these with one accord, devoting themselves to prayer. This doesn't mean that every single moment was spent. Everybody, no, don't you open your eyes. I see you over there, John. Everybody, let's, you know, no, let's pray. Be serious. This isn't what it means. They were probably there for like a week or more. They're eating, they're sleeping, but they are talking about what Jesus was talking about. They are at times like, let's move into a time where we're actually going to close our eyes and pray and other times it was, it's conversation. It's talking about him. I want to tell you that prayer is a mystery to me. It is one of the most difficult things. Now, I talk to the Lord all the time. Many times it's, oops, sorry. Oh man, Lord, sorry for thinking that. Sorry for saying that. Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Would help me help that. Real kinds of feels sporadic and just like, staccato kind of dots, random, all throughout the day, different things, laying in bed at night, thinking stuff. And I think it's the ought to prayer of formal, dear Heavenly Father. I remember the first time I went into a church, this was right after college, my first job in a church, and I knew I was in trouble when the pastor got up there and said, thrice holy God. I was like, what just happened? Even if it was an, uh, you know, authentic expression of reverence, I sure felt out of place. And so this ought to way of prayer sometimes collides with what it's like to just talk to somebody. Like when I get to talk to my wife or my kids or friends, where it's just like, I want to talk to them. I want to hang out with them. And then why all of a sudden when it's like, oh, I got to talk to the Lord. Okay, um, wait, wait, hang on a second. Before I say, almost like it's this address to a professor who's expecting to grade me on a test. But somehow these guys are together. Devoted, they're talking, they're asking. Prayer here for relationships. And remember, think about the people that are in the room. Prayer is a leveler. It brings us all down because if we're focused in talking to the one who loves us, the one who's bought and paid for our salvation, even if it's an enemy, even if it's somebody you don't like, you go up to that person and say, hey, you want to pray together a little bit? They'll be like, what? Oh, okay. What's going to happen when our hearts are directed to the Lord? Things change. Prayer is this leveler, but there's also time. So if I had to say two things that are happening here, prayer and time. Prayer and time. Give it prayer, give it time. And I don't mean give it like formal, I mean just a lifetime of prayer, conversation. Sometimes it's in groups. It's all the time should be you and the Lord individually. Prayer and time will shape you as a follower of Jesus to where you can be a part of a very diverse group. And it has to be back and forth. It has to be a conversation. We're listening. He's speaking. We ask him something. He responds. How does that work? Let's look at some baby steps. Verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up. So sometime after they'd been praying or something, he decides like, it's time to say something. He stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. That's the big room, right? 120 people. What kind of house? Either they were smelling each other a lot or it was, it was a decent sized room. And he said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. 
wow, that's a really seems like a stretch kind of statement. You're making that connection already? Scripture had to be fulfilled. So the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Man, if I'm saying it, I'm just like, he was a tool. He was awful. He was a guide to make sure that those who were arresting Jesus got to the right place. He was numbered among us, was allotted his share in this ministry. Now, the next two verses are super graphic, which makes you be like, wow, let's make a Sunday school lesson out of this for five-year-olds. Okay, we don't. But Luke decided this is important. He's guided by the Holy Spirit to share this information, which means we have to interact with it. This is about Judas. This man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Everybody's talking about it. You hear what happened to Judas? So that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is field of blood. It is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp, and here he's connecting back to what he's saying about David. David didn't know it, but David was talking about Judas. May his camp become desolate. Let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. A few years ago, we were in Israel and we were standing up at one of those panorama spots. We were in Caiaphas, the high priest's house. And Boaz, our tour guide, was talking about something. Like we're looking, oh, there's the Mount of Olives. There's this. It's this huge panorama thing with like labels and stuff. And I remember I just walked over to it and I saw this spot and I was like, field of blood. <gasps> I know what that is. And so I'm doing, I'm like looking, you know, you do that with those maps. You're like trying to find the spot. We're here. You always look for the, you are here. <laughs> I'm here. And then field of blood. Whoa, there's not a house anywhere near it. And I had one of those moments, like those little bit like joyful, giddy moments of like, I've been, hey, this, it happened. It happened just like he said it would. Nobody's living there. Let his camp become desolate. Let there be no one to dwell in it. It was a simple moment, but I tell you what, it brought front and center thinking about Judas. And this is the other thing I thought. Not only were there no houses there, I was looking at the trees. And probably not any of those trees, but there was a tree there and he hung himself. That's graphic. That's the Holy Spirit saying, yeah, think about it for a minute. The first task as a brand new baby church is what? Deal with a traitor, deal with suicide. Oh, that's all. Okay. Like, no, just like, does anybody have anything to share? I'm going to pray a little bit. We can sing and then have some cookies and coffee. No, let's talk about the fact that somebody is a traitor and killed himself. And we're going to have to do something about that. That's intense. But that's what God has them doing. Diverse group of people. Our first task is to deal with something awful. So the verse says, Peter stood up. I'll say something. I think he was led by the Holy Spirit. He didn't sit back and wait. And he gives us something which is so instructive, I think. I think it's stunning what he does here, actually. It's not uncommon to look at this book and when you open to the spot that divides Matthew with Malachi and you have this page that says the New Testament, we kind of want to add a few more words and improved and better and let's get rid of the old. Now, I don't mean that, but a lot of people do. A lot of people would say, aren't we glad that Jesus came to get rid of the Old Testament? Peter doesn't do that. In fact, Peter actually says, hey, wait a minute, that's my Bible. That's the scripture. 
and it isn't old. It's being fulfilled right in front of you. This is more than just good cross-referencing. This is a gift from Peter and from the early church to us. And honestly, it's a gift I wish I had opened sooner. And a gift I hope I'm opening now, especially as we move into and we look at the stuff that's going on in our world. We look at what happened two years ago with the election, with COVID. You know what? Next election that comes around, I want to have opened this gift by then. I want it to be incorporated into my life to know how to do this and not flip out the way I kind of did last time. So what's the gift? What do we see Peter do? And what is all over the Bible? You know what they're doing? They're learning to trust Jesus through awful moments. Notice I said learning to trust. Not, yep, I trust him. That's it. I feel good. feel peace. feel warm inside and everything. I'm good. I trust Jesus. That's not how it works. Lisa and I were talking about this last week. Trust is kind of like this moving target a little bit. You're daily giving over your thoughts. It doesn't mean you're going to feel great. It means you're going to have to cast your anxieties upon him. Learning to trust Jesus through awful moments. How does he do that? Verse 16, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. In other words, here is this awful thing that we are staring at. The fact that we have a traitor in our midst. Not only that, he killed himself. It's not a good look for the Jesus movement, right? It's not a good look. What are we going to do? So Peter takes a hypothetical, symbolic red marker, and he says, this event, and he draws a line to the Old Testament, and he says, this is not something that God was like, oh, I take my hands off the wheel for one moment, and you people do this. No, it's, it's connected. God knows what he's doing. So let's put it in simple terms. What has happened with Judas isn't a mistake that God forgot to deal with. In fact, if you could have gone back into eternity past and heard the plan as it was being laid out, you might have heard something like this. Yeah, how are we going to get them to the garden? Oh, I know. We need a guide. Now, I know that doesn't completely fit with our black and white understanding of things. Paradox is difficult for us because it's a paradox that God can say he is sovereign even over his own betrayal and that the betrayer is still culpable, still responsible for his own actions. I want to show you an example of a way I think you can do this today. And I see it being done in the world. Take a look at this picture did anybody see this video last week? Okay, I'm going to explain it to you. That is a captured Russian soldier. That is a Ukrainian woman with purple hair. I love the purple hair lady. <laughs> Go home, do a search, type in Russian soldier crying. You'll find it, I promise. He was captured. And so the Ukrainians who had been bombed, their homes had been destroyed, people had been killed, decided, hey, can we feed you? Gave him warm, hot food, <clears throat> cup of tea. He's just, he's like woofing it down too, starving. And then she says, you know what? Why don't we call your mom? And you can see her there with the phone. She dials up. FaceTime or something, video call of his mom. And you watch this video. When he sees his mom, he just starts weeping. And you look at this. And last week I watched this. And contrary to 9-11 or other things where I have been in the past, I would watch something like this. And I'll be honest, like 9-11, you're watching, you're feeling like, you get them, Right? USA, USA, get them, bad people, we're good, they're bad. Like, you know, just simplistic garbage. I watched this last week and you know what I'm doing? I'm crying. And I'm like, there it is, there it is. 
The world says, yeah, take the shortcut, take the black and white, hate them. Don't give him food. Don't give him tea. Don't call his mom. But that girl, you can see it. The people around, they're just like, they got more food there too. If you want some more, <laughs> like we'll take care of you. And I realized that's like, wow, Lord, I have so much further to go in knowing how to take awful circumstances and connect them to the grace of God, to the love of God, to the gospel, to our reason for being here, to love people. I'm not trying to say anything about the political moves or anything like that. I know people would say, oh, it's propaganda, whatever. My heart was moved by Jesus when I watched this, when I watched these women feeding this guy and then watching him break down just as a, he's probably like 19 years old. We can do this. We can do this and trust that Jesus will also make things right. Because is Judas still held accountable for his actions? Yeah. Can Peter though draw a line and say, look, God is moving and working. Yes. The details show us that Judas paid for it. We know that even in the other gospels, he tries to fix it. I made a mistake. He goes back to the high priest and he's like, take the money back. I don't want it. He's innocent. They're like, that's not our problem. He throws the money. They use the money to buy the field. He kills himself. It is both a way for us to say God is at work and he uses difficult things, but also a call for us not to make the catastrophic mistake of rejecting Jesus. It's both and. What if we actually assume that everything that the Lord has for us is actually accounted for in his plans? And we choose not to blame him for being mean when something bad happens, but we assume that if we don't quite understand, if it's too deep to make sense of, if it makes us wonder, how could this be the plan? That we do what Peter did. And we can say, I don't know how yet, but I have to believe that God's character is intact at this moment. I have to believe that. It will eventually make sense, but right now it stinks. Learning to trust. Prayer and time. Peter connects those dots for us, but there's another step. They got to do something. They have to actually act. So with Judas' betrayal and destruction, there's a vacancy for a pretty important spot on the team. I'm sure there were some ears that perked up at this moment, maybe some with hopeful anticipation. Oh, I wonder, maybe me. I bet there were some others who were like, never me. No way. No way I could be counted worthy. Honestly, I think that the names that came out, I bet both of those guys were that way. I bet they were like, what? Oh, okay. Let's read the last few verses, verse 21. Peter's still talking. He's connecting the dots and then he, now he's taking action. So it's both and prayer, time, red marker, truth, God's character must be intact. Now let's act. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out, in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John all the way up until the day he was taken from us, one of these guys, must become a witness with us to the resurrection. So the group puts forward two names, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, which I was like, come on, pick a name, dude, one. <laughs> so we're gonna call him Justice um, and Matthias. Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, in the simplicity of this prayer is beautiful. You Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. Nothing super spiritual about that, is there? God, you know everybody here? Which one? Tell us. To take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. They cast lots for them. We'll get to that in a minute. The lot fell on Matthias. So he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So there are a few things going on here that speak to those issues that we've already started talking about of belonging and being a part of what God is doing and feeling like you belong. Two names, Justice and Matthias. I think they're both qualified. I think the group is saying they're both, they both were there. They both have been with us 
from the beginning. They both have good character. They both would be great. These two. And the reason, Peter gives you the reason, we need a witness to the resurrection. I think it's a good thing to remember. Being a part of the body of Christ is not about sitting on your tuchus until it's time to go home. There's a mission. It's not just about getting in. You got your golden ticket and I'm going home. I don't have to worry about anything else. He's like, no, I want you to look at people in Ukraine and actually feel something. I want you to feel the need for the gospel. Not just about being in the club, but about being on task and mission. So wise counsel from people, good. Assess character, good. Requirements, with us from the beginning, witness the resurrection, good. Now what? Now we need help. Simple prayer. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show us which one you've chosen. They went as far as they could based on their own wisdom, and then they asked the Lord, Jesus, show us. Are you doing this in your life? Jesus, what am I supposed to feel when I see what's happening on the news? How can I show compassion for hurting people? Lord, I've run out of wisdom and strength with this relationship. Can you help? What do you require of me today? Who are you wanting me to speak to today? How should I use my money? Where should I go to college? Should I apply for this job? How should I respond to this coworker who's been so hateful and vindictive to me? Lord, what does it look like for me to apologize and make restitution for being a tool to my wife and children? How about those prayers? Those are simple. Those aren't super spiritual. Those aren't formal. They're just, Lord, show me. I think that formula, Lord, you know my heart, show me. <laughs> Lord, you know my heart today, show me. It's a great way to start, just to start conversation with him. So they cast lots. Yeah, I know, it's a little weird. This is in no way the Lord telling you to go to Walmart and buy some dice and start praying with dice. If it's a six, Lord, we're gonna do it. But for some reason they used it at this time. I don't know. Draw a line, something, whatever. It's there. They used it at this time. Proverbs 16:33. The lot is cast in the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. There you go. Put that in your pipe. What happens? Who gets the nod? Matthias gets the nod. When you aren't selected, what should you do? We've all been there. We thought this was going to happen. And instead, the guy with three names gets left out. Maybe he nodded almost like, yeah, I knew it. I knew it wasn't me. Maybe he had a brief moment of thinking, I didn't get picked for Jesus' team. It's okay. I'm glad I was just considered. Thanks a lot, everybody. Honestly, we don't know how he responded. I think we can read between the lines to know that I don't think he made a big stink about it. Because I think they probably would have said that. Justice flipped out, stormed out of the church. <laughs> like, no, he didn't. So what do you do when you think Jesus has forgotten you? left you out, not giving you an important role. Do you see the theme here? I can't find friends at church. I'm leaving. There's too many bad things in life. God, you're such a meanie. I didn't get picked. Throw a fit and bail. Or prayer, time, learning to trust, baby steps, believing the best, drawing the lines when you don't understand. He has never failed you yet. So justice, Joseph Barsabbas, justice, I'll give, you, I'll give it to you, buddy, all three names. It turns out did not bail. Church history has it that he was imprisoned by Nero, the emperor of Rome, for doing what? Proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our boy didn't bail. And then he became a bishop, just means a leader in a church in this little town about 56 kilometers southwest of Jerusalem called Eleutheropolis. And he was martyred and killed for proclaiming the resurrection and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't bail. You know what he did? He bloomed where he was planted. 
Trust the Lord's gardening skills. He knows where to find you. He will take care of you. Let prayer, time, and learning to trust be the defining characteristics of your walk with Jesus. You know, Justice could have easily said, this church stinks. I'm going to find another one. They aren't meeting my needs. They hurt my feelings. I'm not being used. I don't get fed the way I want. You know what the only problem was? It was the only church. There wasn't another one. <laughs> he couldn't go down the street. You bail, you're out. So he's like, well, guess I'm stuck with these people. You know, I've, one of the best gifts, I mentioned this in first service as well, coming to Minnesota was not worrying quotes there, but because there's a little bit, but not worrying when the Lord moves people on. And so I've learned, learned <laughs> to say, thank you so much for how many years you gave us. It's okay. It's okay. Bless you. And it's hard though. It's hard though, especially if you know that some of those things are some of the reasons. And sure enough, last two years, yeah, we've had some of that. Trust the Lord's hand. Trust who he has called us to be. And all I know is just to keep at least being this type of person that stays in it myself, believes the best. Trust, time, prayer. Justice was an integral part and member of the first church ever. That's a ringtone right there. <laughs> You're all right. He was learning to trust Jesus. <laughs> through what was probably a pretty difficult moment. Think about it. When he didn't get picked in the room. Like Matthias, everybody's like, Matthias, yay, just, oh. It's, it's okay, bud. You, I don't know. Can I get you something to drink? This is fine. It's no big. Hey, awesome. We've all done that too, haven't you? It's great. I'm super happy for you. <laughs> but he stayed. Why? Because Jesus was worth it. Those people were worth it. And I'm thankful to somebody like Justice that he stayed around. He didn't bail. He stuck it out. He showed us how to do it through thick and thin, through baby steps, growing pains, learning to be the church. We're going to see a whole lot more of that in Acts. But because he did, because they did, well, guess what? I'm here. You're here. Did you know we're here because that original group of people chose not to bail when it was a little awkward with friendships. They chose not to bail when they had to deal with awful moments. They chose not to bail when maybe they didn't feel like they were getting noticed enough or recognized enough. They stayed. They learned how to do this. And because they did, we're here and billions of others. God used it, the Lord Jesus moving and working. I'm going to have the worship team and those who are serving communion come forward. And you guys can go ahead and begin serving. And I'm going to do what Peter did before we take communion. And let me say this. They stayed at the table together, though it was difficult. You know who didn't stay at the table, the original table? Judas. He actually bailed from the original communion table to go and betray Jesus. <laughs> The table is for those who have said yes to the work, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the eventual return of Jesus. You said yes. You said my life without Christ in my own sin, I can't, I won't make it, but I've accepted him. So the table's for you. But for those of you, maybe you haven't done that, this is a call. It's an invitation to say, come to the table. Come to the table and sit with him. He wants to meet with you. He wants to speak with you. He longs to have a relationship with you. So just like Peter did, I'm going to draw a red line from here. Us experiencing the table together today, all the way back, even past the cross, another 400 or so years back beyond that to the book of Isaiah, when this moment right here was talked about. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. You kind of imagine Isaiah writing this down, thinking, who is this? Who am I writing about, Lord? As one from whom men 
hide their faces. I don't even want to look at him. He looks so bad. We despised him, esteemed him not. And then this moment of clarity as Isaiah heard the words from God and put pen to paper and said, surely, for real, certainly, will be done, fixed in eternity. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrow. Yet we thought, that guy just did something wrong. He's stricken, he's smitten by God and he's afflicted. But, and again, another moment of connecting the dots for Isaiah and us connecting all the way to, but he was pierced for my transgressions. The son of God was crushed for my iniquities. Upon him was punishment that somehow brings me peace. And with his wounds, if I am willing, I'm healed. I'm healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, when Isaiah finished writing that, he probably pushed back and was like, what is that that I just wrote down? How will that be fulfilled? Knowing somehow it connected deeply to him. And so as Jesus sat around the table with them and as we sit around the table today, and he took the Passover meal, connecting another line all the way back to Exodus, and they smeared the blood of a lamb over their door so that when God passed over, they wouldn't die. He said, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. You know, at that moment, he was just like, boy, have I longed for this moment. From eternity past, I have longed for this moment. And after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Let's partake together. sense of it all and he picked up the cup and when he had given thanks thank you father thank you father that this is here he gave it to them and he said believe me you're going to want to drink this drink of it all of you this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins And I'm going to tell you what, I'm not going to drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's partake together. We thank you for drawing lines for us this morning from eternity past to our hearts. Thank you for the early church. Thank you that they were normal people just like us. They struggled. They tried to do life in between these huge moments, difficult moments. They dealt with the same things we do, um, trying to learn how to be in community, how to have deep friendships, how to pray together, how to give grace to one another, how to stomach really awful things, and Lord, how to maybe grieve a little bit when they weren't picked but to trust your hand in their life, baby steps. And thank you for our little church here. Thank you for the grace that is present. I minister to us now as we worship.